Good morning, I'm Jim Jeffrey, one of the pastors at Chapel Point, and so glad to have you here today. Summer is a time of celebrations, isn't it? Celebrating Mother's Day today, celebrating graduations, celebrating weddings and birthdays and all the summer holidays when we can gather with family and have a barbecue and, and enjoy all of that. Well, as God's people, we have every reason to celebrate, don't we? Every reason to celebrate. Gathering together as an opportunity to celebrate. We celebrate as we worship. We celebrate as we pray. We celebrate as we remember the Lord's table. We celebrate as people are baptized. We, we celebrate as we give. We celebrate as we preach and listen to the word of God, that we have every reason to celebrate. And in the Bible, God's people were a celebrating people. And we've gathered together today to celebrate with you. So take your Bibles, if you would, and turn with me to the book of Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 15 is where we're going to be today. But you remember last week in Exodus 14, the crossing of the Red Sea. It was a major, major thing that God did. And he said that he was going to fight for his people and that they didn't need to do anything, that he was going to take care of them. God had actually led them, guided them with a pillar of cloud and a fire right to the edge of the Red Sea to a dead-end street, to a cul-de-sac. And they would have to learn to step into faith and to step into trusting God in spite of where they were. See, the story wasn't going to be about them and what they could accomplish. The story was going to be about what God could do and how his glory would be put on display as he parted the Red Sea and delivered his people through on dry land and then drowned the, the whole Egyptian army. This story, showing the power of God in displaying his glory, would be, re would be reviewed again and again in the Old Testament. They would look back to that event. Uh, think of many psalms, but here's one. Psalm 66, verse 5 and 6. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds towards the children of men. He turned the sea into dry land, and they passed through the river on foot, and we rejoiced in him. The prophets would also look back at that event. Isaiah 43, 16. This, thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters. You know, in a very real way, the parting of the Red Sea as a focus in the Old Testament parallels the gospel in the New Testament, the message of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for us. The historical events there are, are part of our faith and what we celebrate together today. God didn't take his people, though, on the most direct route. If you look at a map of uh, the Middle East, it's really clear that to get from um, Egypt to the promised land, the best route would be along the Mediterranean. That's the shortest, most direct route. But they would have to fight the Philistines, a fierce tribal people, and they weren't ready for that. So God had another plan, and God was going to test them, and God was going to bring them to Mount Sinai, where he was going to make them into a nation and give them his law. We need to understand that when we're in a tight spot, we can discover the depth of a God who can be trusted. Some of you today are in a tight spot. You've been going through a trial, maybe a health difficulty, maybe unemployment, maybe a, a situation in your marriage or a situation with your children. Whatever it is, financial, you might be in a tight spot. God allows those trials into our life just like he allowed his people to come to the Red Sea so that we would discover the depth of a God who could be trusted. And God's going to show his redeemed people how he is going to rule over them. So in Exodus 15, we have a celebration. And we want to have that attitude of celebration today as we look at this passage. So turn there. Let's uh, jump into it together, all right? Exodus 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. My father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea. His chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. 
Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemies. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrew your adversaries. You sent out your fury, your wrath. It consumes them like stubble. In the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The flood stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed into the heart of the sea. And the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire will have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand will destroy them. You blew with your wind, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You've guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They trembled. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. They are the chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. And the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fell upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased, you have redeemed. You will bring them in and plant them in your own mountain. The place, O Lord, that you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands has established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Mary and the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand. And with all the women went out and with her tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. This is really a psalm. It is a song that, that they actually sang on the east bank of the Red Sea. It was a time of celebration. I mean, this was a party. They were rejoicing, and they were worshiping, and they were praising God. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about this psalm, though, is the structure of it, the, the literary devices of it. To really get what's going on here, it, it helps understand it. So imagine your mind with me just a minute, a sideways V, a sideways V. It's called a chiastic structure. Just for fun, say that with me. Chiastic structure. Thank you. Very good. Okay. A sideways V. And so what you have is you have basically seven parts in this psalm. You have an opening part and a closing part that corresponds. Then there's a second part and a sixth part that correspond. And then you have a third part and a, and a fifth part that corresponds. And the fourth part is in the middle of the V. It's the focus of the psalm. And we're going to just see that briefly together, okay? So look at verse 1. We're told that Moses and the people of Israel are singing the song. So it's a congregational worship expression. And this is the chorus that they sang. I'll sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. He's been victorious. The horse and the rider he's thrown into the sea. You look at the other end that corresponds to that, all the way down to verse 20 and 21. Miriam, in place of Moses, is the one leading this worship. Miriam is the sister of Moses and Aaron. She's got to be about 90 years old at this time. And uh, she is called a prophetess. She's the first prophetess named in the Bible. And it's the only place in Exodus that she's named. But Miriam is leading this together with the, the uh, ladies and they're dancing. So she has a tambourine. And she's playing the tambourine as she sings. Now, 90 years old, she can still get it on apparently, okay? And you have, you have all the ladies with tambourines. You know, they had to leave, but they packed tambourines when they packed to leave because apparently they were planning on celebrating. I don't know what you packed, but they were planning on celebrating. I want you to notice the second part of the structure that happens here. What you have is an exaltation of, of Jehovah's salvation and his deliverance, the, the celebration of that, the exaltation of that. And so in verse 2 uh, and verse 3, he says, the Lord's my strength and my weakness. He's my song. He's become my salvation. By the way, that word in Hebrew is Yeshua. It is the basis of the name Jesus. He's my salvation. 
This is my God. I'm going to praise him. My father's God, the God of the patriarchs, and I'm going to exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. God is a warrior God who overcomes and, and has victory. The Lord's his name. And so he talks about, he talks about that. Then if you look down at, at verse 19, the same thing that corresponds to that. When the horses of Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the people of Israel walked through on dry ground. And so again, you've got this focus of reminder of Jehovah's salvation celebration. If you get down to the third part and to the, to the, uh, to the uh, fifth part of this, of this uh, chiastic structure, you notice that he looks to the past and then the corresponding thing, he looks to the future. So he looks to the past and he says, here's what God did. He talks about Pharaoh's chariots and, and his army, his chosen officers, and the floods covered them and how God in his glorious power and his right hand shattered the enemy how the greatness of his majesty, he overthrew them. He, he uh, sent out his wrath and he consumed them. The blast of his nostrils speaking of the, of the wind that came, that uh, the waters piled up, stood up in a heap, so there was a, a way through the middle of the Red Sea for the people of Israel to go. He, in, in verse 9, he actually talks about the trash talk of the, of the Egyptian army before the battle. They, they were saying, I'm going to pursue, I'm going to overtake, I'm going to divide the spoil, I'm going to have my full desire, I'm going to destroy them. They spoke too soon. Spoke too soon. You know, this happens sometimes in athletic events. They trash talk, it happens in battle. There's a little trash talk going on here. And God is saying, you think you're going to do that? When God blew with his wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead. Now, the corresponding part of that, that's looking past to what God had just done in the parting of the Red Sea. But he's going to then, in the corresponding part, look to the future. Verse 14, the people have heard. He's going to talk about all the nations that are in, in the promised land. Pangs that see the inhabitants of Philistia. He talked about the Edomites, the Moabites, the Canaanites, and how they were all going to be afraid. Look at the description. They tremble. Pangs have seized them. They're dismayed. Trembling seizes them. They've melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Why? Because of what God was going to do through his people. And so they look past, and then they look future. And in the very same way, we look back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We look back to those events of his death burial and resurrection. We look back to the cross and the empty tomb. And when we do that, we're reminded just like they were of how God redeemed them as a people. We are reminded that what Jesus did on the cross was to redeem us. But by looking back, they then looked forward and said that what God had done there gives us hope for the future of what he's going to do when we get into the land. In the same way, you may want to write down in the margin of your Bible there, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, where Paul says this, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and then he talks about the coming event of the rapture of the church. He said, we have confidence because God did this in the past that he will do this in the future. Friends, the reason I have hope for the future is because I have a God who's already done what he's done in the past. The gospel of Jesus Christ in the past gives me confidence in the reign of Jesus Christ in the future. Friends, just as certain as this happened, this will happen, and we can be sure of that. And that's what he's saying to them. I want you to notice, in the middle of the, of the structure, though, there is this great worship focus. Who is like you, verse 11, O Lord, among the gods? The answer is nobody. That was shown in Egypt. Who is like you, majestic in your holiness, set apart from anything? You are awesome in your glorious deeds, doing wonders. You are a wonder-working God. When you stretch out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. Look at this. You have led in your steadfast love the people that you have redeemed. This is the center focus, the redemption of God. They're celebrating redemption. And you have done this. You have done this. You've guided them by your strength to your holy abode. In the beginning of verse 13, he says, you've led them in your steadfast love. 
That's a wonderful, glorious word in the Hebrew. It literally means God's covenant faithfulness, God's steadfast love. It's a word that is so full of meaning that it's hard to translate it. It's used again and again in the Old Testament to speak of how God is a God who his love and his mercy and his grace is faithful because he's made a covenant and he's going to keep it. So in the middle of all this, the focus is God has redeemed his people, and the response is celebrate. The response is we need to rejoice in who God is and what God has done. So the focus of the passage, so think about this. When I, when I read this passage, one of the things I love to do is to just highlight the names and the attributes and the works of God that are here. So just think about the celebration. The Lord is my strength. He's my song. He's my salvation. He's my God. He's the God of the patriarchs and Moses. God is a man of war who triumphs over his enemies. God, is, his majesty is great. His wrath consumes. There's none like him. He's majestic in holiness, awesome in his glorious deeds. He's a wonder-working God. He is redeemer, and he is king, and we celebrate him today, don't we? I hope you came ready to celebrate. I hope you came ready to celebrate because if you don't have a tambourine in your hand, you ought to have one in your heart. You ought to be ready to celebrate God. You know, I don't understand sometimes I, I'll meet a Christian, it's just like they were weaned on dill pickle juice. It's just like, really? You look at their face and say, what is it with you? I mean, just constantly negative. Now, friends, please hear me. I know life is hard. I know that there's struggles and there's difficulties in life. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But friends, we have every reason to celebrate because of who God is. When you look inside you, no reason to celebrate. When you look around you, no reason to party. But when you look up, look up vertically to who God is, you have every reason to praise and worship that God. And so as God's people, we are the people of God who ought to celebrate. When we look around us in all the brokenness of the world, we need to be those who have joy in our hearts and celebration because of who God is. And so the question I have for you is, do you celebrate what the Lord has done? Do you celebrate what God has done for you? Friends, if you celebrate the Redeemer who's come to rule over you, it'll make a difference in the second part of this, the second question I have for you. And it's this. Do you grumble about what the Lord has not done? Because celebration, very interesting, gives way to grumbling. That never happens to you, does it? Celebration gives way to grumbling. So here's what happens. Verse 22 Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness, that means the desert area of Shur. They were three days in the wilderness, mark that, three days of travel with children and flocks and herds, and they had no water. That's a problem. When they came to, to Merah, they couldn't drink the water of Merah, which means bitter, by the way, because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Merah. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. Now, I want you to focus on verse 24 for a moment. The people grumbled. They grumbled against Moses. And by doing that, they're really grumbling against God. Grumbling means they complained. They complained. And, and we're going to see throughout the book of Exodus, uh, and we're going to see in the book of Numbers, this was a repeated problem with the people of God. Whenever there was a problem, whenever there was a need, their first reaction was to grumble, to complain. They grumbled when, that they didn't have anything to eat, and then they grumbled about the manna. They grumbled against Moses. They grumbled continually. They complained. They complained. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, in, in a context where he's talking about the wilderness wanderings, and he mentions that, that these are examples for us. So in other words, what happened to them has application for us. And one of the things he says, he says, don't do idolatry like they did, don't commit immorality like they did, and then he says, don't grumble like they grumbled, 1 Corinthians 10, 10. So grumbling is something that God says is sin equal to idolatry and immorality, you get that? He puts it on the same level. Grumbling is sin. So they're grumbling against God. They're grumbling against Moses. Philippians 2.14 says this, do everything without complaining, without complaining. If you've ever been on a road trip with children 
and you pull out of the driveway and they say, are we there yet? I'm hungry. I have to go to the bathroom. I mean, does that happen to anybody but me? You know, grumbling. Then think about Moses with over a million people with all their children on a road trip. Grumbling and complaining. Interesting. Um, I read this recently. These are actual complaints received by a resort chain. So these are people at a resort, and this is what they write as their complaints. On my holiday to India, I was disgusted to find that almost every restaurant served curry. I don't like spicy food. <laughs> Friends, it's India. We booked an excursion to a water park, and no one told us we had to bring our own swimsuits and towels. We assumed to be included in the price. Duh. The beach was too sandy. We had to clean everything when we got returned to our room. Beach, sand. No one told us there would be fish in the water. The children were scared. Hmm. It took us nine hours to fly home from Jamaica to England. It took the Americans only three hours to get home. Seems unfair. <laughs> These last two are really good. We had to line up outside to catch the boat, and there was no air conditioning. You're outside! <laughs> I was bitten by a mosquito. The brochure didn't mention mos mosquitoes. Really, people are creative with what they complain about. I want you to notice, though, what Moses did. The people are complaining. What Moses did is really wise for us. Moses prayed. He cried to the Lord, verse 25. Moses prayed. We could probably write a new version of an old hymn. Why pray when you could grumble? Friends, we grumble because we have a need. We grumble because we're hurting. We grumble because we have a problem. But how many times do we grumble before we've ever prayed? Because when you pray, you encounter the living God. When you pray, God grants his wisdom. When you pray, God gives his grace. When you pray, God gives his guidance. And we grumble, but we don't pray. James says, you have not because you ask not. Friends, the next time you start grumbling, saying, have I prayed about this? Am I regularly praying about this to seek God's provision and God's grace? I want you to notice that what they were grumbling about was water. So water kind of fills this, the water of the Red Sea, and now the problem of water. They couldn't drink the water. The water was bitter. Have you ever had water that you get out of a faucet someplace and it just tastes really bad, sulfury or something like that? I want to tell you that when my family moved to the Catskill Mountain of, uh, region of New York, and mom and dad bought 108 acres of property, uh, half of a Catskill Mountain, at the bottom of that mountain there were springs that were continually underground springs. And the water came from that down across a field and into the basement of our house. My, my dad constructed about five different tanks there that they could fill with water. It looked like a still, whatever a still looks like, okay? And, and, and it had all those tanks there. And when they were all full, the water went underground to the fire pond. And you could sometimes see the water coming out of there, just meaning we had all the water that we needed. You have never tasted water as good as what came from my dad's springs. I mean, it tastes so good. But this water was bad, real bad. So they've been three days with no water. They get to the water, and they can't drink it. It's bitter water. Why did God lead them there? God allows things in our lives to test us. And this was a test. This was a test. They're drinking the water and they're complaining about the water. It's called bitter water. Matter of fact, the word Mara is used in the book of Ruth for a lady who was bitter and said, don't call me by my name, call me Mara. I am bitter woman. Bitterness, friends, is a grace shortage. Hebrews 12, 15. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you and by it many be defiled. Bitterness is always a grace shortage. 
It can be a grace shortage by someone that has hurt you and you're unwilling to forgive them. Someone who has disappointed you and you're not willing to, to give them grace. Someone, some experience of life that has just been difficult for you. And rather than tapping the grace of God, you become bitter and negative and caustic and critical. You ever spend time with a bitter person? I try not to. Once I've done all I can to try to help them. In what way is bitterness a grace shortage? Bitterness is not a shortage of grace. It's a failure to appropriate grace. God has an abundance of grace for you. Grace for salvation. Grace for your Christian life. Grace for suffering. Grace for serving. God invites us to come to the throne of his grace. He gives us the word of his grace. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of his grace. And God gives us grace. Grace is to fill into the brokenness of your life and the hurts in your life and the needs in your life. Friends, bitter experiences in life need to become the opportunity to step in and experience God's grace. And here, God tells Moses, here's a log, throw it in. Now, some people say, well, there must have been some medicinal value or some kind of a scientific thing. No, friends, it was just symbolic of something. The log was symbolic of something that was going to happen for us outside of the city of Jerusalem on a cross where Jesus would be crucified and all the grace you would ever need would be provided. Friends, the greatest problem you ever had, the greatest need you ever had, the greatest hurt that you ever had, when you come to Jesus and you come to the cross and the gospel, he has more grace than you will ever need. You don't have to be bitter. You choose to be bitter. You choose to be bitter. Because you fail to appropriate the grace of God in your life. Uh, friends, ple I plead with you. If God's grace is what God promises it to be, then we need to appropriate that grace into our hurts and our pains, into our conflicts, into the broken relationships in our life. And that will keep you from becoming a bitter person. And so we're, we're, we're called to do that. We're called to do that. Look at the very last verse in the chapter. God then leads them to a place called Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they had camped there by the water. God knew all along what he was going to do. He's going to take them to this place where there's bitter water so that he can then take them to this place where there's fresh water. 12 springs of water, 70 palm trees. We're talking oasis here. We're talking what they called a weighty there. There, God said, I'm going to provide for you in an amazing way. I'm going to provide for you. Here's a third question from this passage. Do you, do you surrender to what God has spoken? Now, in the midst of this passage, as we come towards the end, the Lord made for them, in verse 25, second part of the verse, a statute and a rule, that God's wisdom and principles and his laws and he tested them, saying, If you diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Do you surrender to what God has spoken? So here in, these, in this, this last part of the passage, it talks about God speaking to his people. It says God gave his word. He gave a statue and a rule. God tested them. Students know that if you have a unit of study, you're going to be tested. Do you know in the Christian life, you're going to be tested. God's going to put you through a unit of spiritual growth and saying, it's time for a test. It's time for a test. And then he says to them, if you listen, if you diligently listen, verse 26, and then later said, if you give ear to his commandments... One of the words for obedience in the Bible is literally to listen under, to listen under. In other words, to listen to what God has to say with an attitude of submission to his authority. That's what he's talking about here. Are you listening under? Are you listening with submission? And are you doing what is right in his eyes? Are you choosing that which is righteous? And he says, if you do that and you keep, you keep, you give ear to his word, I'm not going to put any of the diseases, the plagues I put on Egypt, because I am the Lord who heals you. Friends, do you surrender to what God has spoken? You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that listening to God, and I believe God wants to speak to us today. I hope you believe that. 
God speaks through creation and and puts on display his glory. God speaks through scripture. And God spoke ultimately through the person of his son. God wants to speak to you and God wants to speak to me. The question is, are you listening? Are you listening to God? Are you listening with that attitude of submission to God? Are you, do you surrender to what God has spoken? You know, it's interesting with our children, you could say five times in a, in a, in a clear voice, please go pick up your room, please go make your bed, and they didn't hear it. But you whisper in the kitchen two rooms away, we're going to serve ice cream, and they come running. <laughs> Isn't it interesting? We listen to what we want to listen to. We hear what we want to hear. Do you want to hear the voice of God? Friends, if you don't spend time in his word, you don't want to hear his voice. If you're not reading your Bible, you're not listening for his voice. If you're not digging into this so that you can hear the voice of God, I believe God wants to speak to every believer every day through the word of God. Are you ready to listen? And are you ready to surrender to his will? Are you ready to do that? You see, friends, celebration should take care of grumbling, And celebration should make our heart ready to listen and say, what do you have for me, God? What is it that you have to say? So I want to encourage you to do some things with this. How can the celebration of redemption with Jesus be a regular part of your daily life? What if we all started every day saying, Lord, I want to just bring my heart back to the cross and the empty tomb and remember what you did there. I want to worship you. I want to praise you. Do you believe that God is actually working for his glory in your life? And is that what you care about the most? Do you take time to declare and to celebrate and acknowledge what God has done? Maybe you need to write a song of praise, like Moses did here. You know, one of the things I do in my spiritual disciplines every day is after reading the Bible, I will take some of the things I learned about God and I'll turn it into a short paragraph that I can turn into praise and worship. And every day, it's, it's just fresh in my heart. I want to encourage you to do that. You can put it on your fridge. I'm not saying in your fridge, on your fridge. Invite somebody to hold you accountable to any grumbling that you have in life. Who in your life can say to you, you know what, you're grumbling and you're complaining and you're bitter and you need to deal with it. Who's in your life close enough to do that? Friends, if you open your heart to that, God will speak. God will speak. So this song of Moses is going to be celebrated for all of eternity. I want you to stand with me, and we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to have you read it out loud, okay? Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 to 4. I'm going to read it. It's going to be on the screen, and then we're going to read it out loud and celebrate it. This, we're told in Revelation that this song of Moses is going to be sung for all of eternity. So we need to get tuned up now, all right? And they sing the song of Moses, a servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now say it with me, okay? Here we, here we go. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Celebrate the glory of our Redeemer and our King.